I'd like to start off today with our land acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pagane, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Today we have with us Dr. Jennifer Zwicker, who is the Director of Health Policy at the School School of Public Policy, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary, a Canada Research Chair, Tier 2 in Disability Policy for Children and Youth, and a Deputy Scientific Officer for Kids Brain Health Network. Her research program assesses interventions and informs policy around allocation of funding, services, and supports for youth with disabilities and their families. Strong stakeholder and government collaboration has been critical in the translation of peer-reviewed publications to policy papers, op-eds, and briefing notes for provincial and federal ministries and Senate committees. Her work recently informed the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences National Autism Strategy Working Group and the Royal Society of Canada Expert Working Group to develop disability inclusive policy during the COVID-19 pandemic. She has been recognized for her policy leadership as an Action Canada alumni, Governor General Leadership Forum, and Canada's top 40 under 40. Dr. Zwicker, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Tisha, for that introduction. And, and hi, everybody. Uh, nice to virtually see you on the participant list. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going through some information here today around kind of disability policy and, and kind of approaches for engaging with policy. Um, and then we have a, a panel discussion um, with uh, Genevieve and Brittany and Marina who will, will be here. So. Um, I'm looking forward to going through both aspects with you today. Um, just wanted to acknowledge many supporters and funding partners um, for a lot of this work. Um, and I just wanted to start off, and I, I often start most of my talks off with this, is and maybe I can stop someday when this is not um, the challenge anymore, but um, sort of an aspirational statement from the UNICEF report in 2007 saying that the true measure of a nation's standing is how well it attends to its children, including their health, safety, material security, education, and socialization, and their sense of being loved, valued, and included in the families and societies into which they were born. Um, it's, take, it's put over top of our, you know, mountains in Kananaskis, taking from Mount Lougheed, actually, and, um, you know, I think it's, it's a really aspirational um, statement that really hasn't um, come to fruition in Canada. So we know that UNICEF, um, UNICEF reports, many of you are probably familiar, Canada ranks quite low for developed nations um, in terms of child health and well-being. Uh, public policy is, I would say, at the root of that in the sense that um, we don't often have a lot of a cohesive policy um, strategy or, or system for children. Um, so we know that there's a lot of challenges around youth mental health, childhood obesity, suicide and substance use epidemics, um, and, and fundamentally kind of importance of having policy that improves child health um, outcomes ultimately impacts adult outcomes. So we need to recognize kind of that lifespan approach and this is a fundamental piece. Um, just wanted to highlight that really policy does have impact. And if you were ever in doubt of that, we just went through that we're, we're currently in a pandemic and um, you know, we've seen in real time the impacts of policies that are rapidly implemented. I think everybody's really felt the impacts of, of um, COVID and pandemic type policies that occur. Um, we know that there's significant long term, short term impacts. Um, and this was a report that I was, a, I was privileged to be a part of through the Royal Society talking about the impacts of the pandemic on um, persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at it. But um, you know, some of the guiding principles were really nothing about us without us and sort of this disability inclusive approach, which I'll talk a bit about um, in the presentation today. Um, and really the recognition that it's important to accommodate everybody and not have a one size fits all approach in your policies and services that you're developing. I think we're seeing that also from the pandemic and the policies that have rolled out. So one thing that 
um, if there's kind of one take home message that I hope you get from this presentation and from the panel discussion, it's how important it is for research and policy to engage with people, people's lives that it impacts. Um, so I'm going to play um, a, a digital story that we um, did working with um, one of the family members in our advice or family members in our study on the COVID-19 pandemic and um, kind of give you that context on uh, one, one family's perspective. So I'm just going to shift here, just the awkward zoom shift. And I will share this. You can see that Leticia. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I stared at the one inch stack of paper on the boardroom table. I knew a diagnosis was coming. I just didn't expect so much. Autism, ADHD, borderline low IQ, mild Tourette's, DCD. I'd heard most of them before, but I had lots of questions. How would this impact our life? And what is DCD? A physiotherapist replied, it's developmental coordination disorder, impacting executive function, particularly affecting fine and gross motor coordination. To be honest, we're shocked he's already learned to ride a bike. Driving home, I reflected on how grateful I was that I hadn't known about his DCD four years ago when he spent an entire day falling off his bike before finally mastering it. And I realized that when a child with autism is pursuing their passions, nothing can stop them. As a teenager, seven years later, he suddenly said, I need new friends to get together with. Can you help? He had never shown interest in friendship before, and it was hard to contain my excitement. I started looking for new activities that night. We started with a homeschool art class, and he loved it. While DCD made some of the activities more challenging, his desire for friendship, along with a newfound passion for art, was helping him improve and engage. Then, late one night, we got the email. His art class was abruptly ending because of a new virus called COVID-19. He was angry, I was devastated. I had waited 16 years for him to want to make friends and overnight, all the new opportunities we had been planning were lost. As a homeschool family, all of our extracurricular activities were in the community, not in a school. So even when schools reopened a few months later, all our resources stayed closed. Even my activities were lost. I'd been doing jiu-jitsu for two years and didn't realize how vital it had become to my mental health until it was gone. I needed that space, those friends, that community to be the best mom I could be for my two autistic children. As the pandemic dragged on, my younger son began to show signs of agoraphobia. One day, as I was going out for groceries, he said to me, Mommy, don't die. I realized we needed to leave the house. We needed to be around other people. COVID restrictions had made us feel alone, afraid, and abandoned by society. I called a friend in desperation and arranged to go for a weekly walk with her and two of her children who were the same age as my boys. At first, leaving the house was very hard. When we finally got out, there was little conversation. We had to stop often to catch our breath, and we had to encourage the kids to go off on their own. But we knew it was important, and we kept going out every week. Now, two years later, we're best friends and the kids are choosing independence. It's great to see that they've each developed one friend during this time, but now my oldest is 18 and I wonder how can I help him expand his friendship circle? I've heard people say, it's just two years, children are resilient, but there have still been lost opportunities for youth with developmental challenges. It's my hope that in the future, all public health decisions will be made with awareness of the impact on neurodiverse youth and their families. All right, I'm just gonna switch back here. Mm 
There we go. Uh, so I think you can see that I'm on the right screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so the intent of sharing that was really to, to talk about the main message I'm trying to get across is, is the importance of, of um, family engagement and research and, and lived experience in, in research and policy and, and kind of be keeping that at the heart and center of things. So, you know, hopefully there's a lot of those themes that you're hearing in that um, amazing story from Sarah um, that come up from some of the, the data that we're gonna talk about here today. So as a quick overview, and again, I'm gonna kind of try to run through this fairly quickly and then we'll get to a panel discussion. We're gonna talk a little bit about disability policy in Canada, talk a bit about how data uh, informs policy and services, um, talk about some experiences accessing services that we've seen kind of before and after the pandemic and the importance of, of co-design. So key take home messages are really that, you know, health outcomes are impacted by services beyond the health sector. Um, and I think you could probably see that from, from um, especially, you know, this is the Calgary Adaptive Hub uh, network, thinking about the role of physical activities and um, as being very important. Um, thinking about the role of data and shifting individual experiences to collective action. Um, the design and implementation of disability inclusive policy response and recovery is, is a critical um, um, shift that we need to make. Um, and the importance of access to services and integrated systems and services being really important. So what does disability policy looks like, look like? You know, if you think about the word disability policy, I think even the word, the term is sort of a very, um, you know, disability is sort of a, a very um, difficult term, I would say. And it's, it's a challenging thing, I think, because um, on some level, it's the term we need to use so that we can kind of engage in the current landscape that exists, which is sort of disability policy. But, um, you know, I think what we're really focused around is, is function and, and kind of um, uh, trying to enable full participation in society kind of as aligned with the, the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But policy is really um, things government choose and choose not to do. Um, it can kind of be defined as uh, systems, laws, regulatory measures. Um, and it, it's really important to think about the course of action interaction chosen by public authorities. And, and again, we, we saw that throughout the pandemic in particular. So I think it's really put, um, put uh, the role of policy uh, in a different light for people. Um, really, disability policy is guided by the um, UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities and, and human rights frameworks, um, but they tend to be fairly conceptual. Um, and then there's you know, federal government policies through multiple ministries, such as particularly Public Health Agency of Canada, Canada and Employment and Social Development. Um, Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency is a big player through the Disability Tax Credit, um, and then some national legislation that's being developed. And then many provincial and territorial government policies with many ministries um, involved. Um, and then local um, municipal policies uh, through physical activity and the built environment, very important, as well as not-for-profit charities and community organizations. Um, so some examples you could think about, I mentioned the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, there's also, uh, like I mentioned, the, in the federal government, the disability tax credit, um, lots of discussion going around Bill C-22 with the disability benefit, something to pay attention to. Also lots going on with the National Autism Strategy and that development, um, the Canada Accessibility Act um, and um, other, other legislations that are being developed. Um, provincially, it's, it's really um, dependent on the province, uh, but some, some groups have more specified kind of um, advocates and, and centralized roles of disability policy and government. Others are very um, distributed across ministries. Um, you know, I think a real challenge is, is kind of shifting away from the medical model to um, more of the social model of disability and looking at sort of functional, um, functional uh, design of, of policy rather than kind of using medical diagnosis as a, as a key um, eligibility criteria. And uh, really a thing to recognize is that we actually don't spend that much on disability policy in Canada relative to other OECD countries. So Canada's listed here in red. Um, and we're well below the OECD average, so something to also keep in mind. Uh, we, we've done a, a bit of an analysis of how to shift from um, taking some of the you know, UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities to um, the actual implementation in policy and practice. And you know, it really does, it really sometimes is challenging to go from that kind of aspirational kind of 
framing of, of rights conventions to actual to, to policy implementation. But you know, we've mapped things like Article 19, the right to live in the community, the right to education through inclusive education, right to work through disability employment supports, um, the right to adequate standard of living through things like um, income support programs and, and like age, for example, um, and respect for home and the family um, so for, through family supports, uh, as well as accessible health services. It's, it's important to recognize that, uh, like I mentioned, in the provinces, and this is a paper that uh, Brittany had, had led, um, published in Canadian Public Policy, um, talking about expenditures on disability supports varies a lot across provinces. And, um, you know, this is something where some provinces are spending a lot more on um, income supports, direct income supports, where some are spending a lot more on services. Um, in the, the paper, if you're interested, you can check out the, we have a kind of data dashboard portal, you can go to that link there and kind of check it out. But um, it gives a contrast of how the provinces are very different across, um, you know, spending on adults, on children, and, and everything uh, is very different across different provinces. So, you know, would, would suggest that there's a real need for um, better alignment of, of kind of how things are allocated um, for children and families um, within each province. So fundamental message is really that health outcomes are impacted by services beyond the health sector. And it's important to recognize that, that there's many players involved in, in, um, in this space. Uh, we also know that data is really important for informing policy. So policy tends to be influenced through, you know, kind of key frameworks of ideas, interests, institutions. Um, and, you know, the ideas is really the knowledge or beliefs of, of what we know in a policy context. And that is informed by data. What tends to happen is you have this gap between potential access or available services, which are all the policies, program services that are available, and what we call realized access, which is who actually can get access to what's available. And um, you know, this is impacted by eligibility programs and eligibility and, and uh, many factors. Uh, we also know that there's huge differences across the life course, but that um, policy and access to services has a big impact across the life course. So positive school environments or um, access to, to care and services, um, uh, can really affect income, income, socioeconomic status, um, the built environment, all those things can really impact people's developmental trajectory. So again, this is the space of, of policies and services. Um, we did some analysis of um, population level outcomes for um, using the Canadian Survey Disability, looking at um, youth over the age of 16, because that's where the survey starts. Um, and identified for persons with disability um, that activities of daily living, about 70% have needs that go unmet. For education outcomes, about 40% don't complete high school, 30% complete high school, and 30% complete post-secondary. Um, employment, about 65% are not in the labor force. And mean personal income is about 16,000 a year. So, you know, these are important things to understand at a population level so that you can kind of start targeting policies to better address these outcomes and, you know, map this against uh, the Heckman curve, which talks about um, the return on investment of, of investing earlier in child and youth supports and recognizing that this is, I think, a huge um, untapped opportunity. One example of where this we can have this impact, and I, I brought this up because there's such robust discussion going on right now around the child dis or the disability benefit. Um, we published a paper recently in Social Indicators Research looking at um, poverty measures among persons with disabilities. Um, we currently use something called the market basket measure. And um, basically our analysis was looking at the extraordinary extra costs associated with having a disability um, that people who are living in poverty experience. And there needs to be more of a recognition that um, there, there are additional costs despite someone who's living in poverty, these are not it just because you're a person experiencing poverty doesn't mean you also still don't have a disability and have these extra costs. And so by using the same measure across to measure poverty, um, we're actually underestimating poverty levels amongst um, persons with disabilities. So um, recognizing particularly the need for um, factoring in caregiving costs, um, medication costs, um, and assistive devices and aids, um, things that aren't often covered under the medical expenses credits, um, are important aspects to keep in mind. And, you know, again, just trying to talk about this importance of 
the role of, of these sort of supports and services such as income supports um, in shifting trajectories, developmental trajectories, and this is building on Neil Halton's work, um, shifting people from an at-risk to a um, delayed or disordered or to a healthy trajectory, depending on their environment. So a, a key message here is really that, um, unfortunately in Canada, our data in this space is, is very limited. We have some surveys um, through this um, Statistics Canada Canadian Survey Disability um, we really have no longitudinal survey on youth going on in Canada right now. So administrative data is really the place where you can kind of address a lot of these population level questions, but um, that has a lot of limitations. So just, just a real um, importance of, of um, using data that's available. And um, we have a lot of rich cohort data sets that are emerging here in Calgary. So that's, I think, helpful as well. Um, you know, recognizing that these policies really impact children and families uh, one of the Canadian Survey Disability stats was that families provide over 80% of support for activities of daily living, um, yeah, and about 70% are going on net, unmet. And you know, again, recognizing that it, it's it's data from a quantitative sense, but also qualitative in the sense of understanding what uh, what families' experiences are. And this quote from a Senate Standing Committee I thought was was quite powerful about uh, the the parent really being worried about securing their son's future. Um, and um, worrying about not having a plan or a support network kind of beyond uh, the, their current situation. So a, a key message here is that really that data can shift individual, individual experiences. So kind of having quotes and stories from families, such as Sarah's story, taking a lot of what, what's in Sarah's story and adding population level data to that can be a really powerful message in sort of informing policy and practice. Um, the, the last piece before I kind of frame up for our panel discussion that I wanted to get into is talking about some work we've done around experiences accessing supports and service, both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. So uh, this is a map that a, a family has drawn, a parent has drawn of all the services that they're navigating, you know, across the school and health and developmental supports. Um, and I'll note here at Legal Financial, I'll note here in particular for this group, the recreation and community supports that are, you know, solidly in that map and are very important. So this is uh, two messages. One, obviously it's very complex and it's a lot to navigate. Um, and it really is left up to the families to navigate, um, but how important these are for the kind of daily, uh, meeting kind of daily needs. Um, so, so addressing access to services and fragmentation is a really key priority that needs to needs to occur. Um, we got into to address that we've done a couple studies, one before the pandemic, um, to better understand experiences um, accessing services. Um, and then a second was uh, during the pandemic to kind of understand how the pandemic had impacted experiences accessing services. And then we did a, a third study that also uh, focused specifically on physical activity that uh, Marina, who was the honor student, did um, looking at um, experiences during the pandemic and their impact on physical activity. And so I'm gonna highlight a, a few um, findings from those studies to give you a sense of, of what we learned about families' experiences. So uh, in this first study pre-pandemic, looking at access to disability supports and programs in Canadian provinces, we did a survey of close to 500 families across Canada, um, and then did qualitative interviews with 81 families um, with you know, maximum variation sampling across provinces and disability type and a number of other factors. Um, and we were looking at asking you know, their experiences in accessing disability sports programs. I think of particular note, most families reported that they had difficulty or very, it was very difficult or, or somewhat difficult in, in accessing sports and services. Um, we, we mapped out from the, the survey data and from the interviews, kind of a pipeline of, of a process that occurs. So you need to recognize there's a need for support, learn about the programs, apply for the programs and access programs. We identified that about 68% were not accessing government funded programs. And what was really found is that there was multiple points along the way where there were real barriers and challenges. Some of it was a lack of information about programs. Some of it was difficulty with the application process. Um, some of it was not being eligible at, at later stages when they found out when they were trying to apply. And some of it was just that the program design and delivery didn't meet their needs. 
Um, so these are all kind of all factors that were important um, for understanding. And one thing that did seem to really emerge was that access to quality guidance was a really big um, sort of facilitator in, in accessing programs. And so this could look like sometimes their accountant who had knowledge about the systems or a healthcare provider or someone in the community or a peer um, um, family member or something like that that had, had more knowledge. So that is, I think, a really important, important point. Um, so these support from third parties, um, parent networks, physician knowledge of programs was a big, a big factor. Um, also, some of the barriers really thinking about challenges in the application program programs and uh, long wait lists. So then uh, a key, another key message, I guess, from here is that there is a role for all of us in kind of supporting this access to services with quality guidance. And I think it is sort of able to build this bridge between potential access and realized access. So in the second two studies I'll, I'll touch on is, is really talking about um, the impacts of COVID-19 on this pre-existing challenges with a, a, a challenging system, kind of the other layers that were added on. So in this study, we did uh, a policy scan working in conjunction with uh, Keiko, Chicago, Keiko Chicago at uh, McGill um, and her team. Um, they did a policy scan on disability inclusive policies, conducted interviews with caregivers and youth, uh, 40 caregivers, 40 youth across Canada and, and a co-design with our advisory council. So if you remember this map, um, kind of pre-pandemic. Uh, the, the big challenge is really a lot of these services disappeared overnight, um, seemingly overnight um, for, for many families. And so while it was complex to navigate before, then families were just left often with not much to navigate. And I was probably being generous in leaving on kind of the, the health and the info and advocacy leadership sections. I think some families might suggest that everything should be blank, be blanked out. Um, and, and a particular note for this group, again, community and recreation, I think is largely largely um, was was gone. And, um, you know, this quote from a parent participant, I think is, is very powerful about the impacts of that talking about um, so with school shutdowns and, and therapies um, stopping that, you know, there was sometimes challenging behaviors that were occurring and um, uh, more utilization of a mental health unit in and out of hospitals. So, you know, the importance of, of knowing the implications of, of some of these decisions, I think is is very important. So some uh, key key findings from the, the COVID study that we did is really that there were these delays, denials, and disruptions to services. Um, the implications are really the, the changes to the lives of youth with NDD and their families. And many of these changes were, you know, changes to mental health, impacts on academic success, deconstruction of social networks, um, changes to access to society. Um, as we heard from Sarah's story, uh, hopefully a lot of this kind of resonates somewhat from what Sarah was saying in her story. I think this is where we can kind of try to back up that story with, with some of the, the broader um, population level data we've collected. Um, develop, impacts on developmental progress and shifts on caregiving capacity. Um, and this, these findings are written up and are recently published, uh, led by Genevieve, um, who you'll hear from on the panel soon. Um, another aspect we looked into was impacts on physical activity programs. Again, it's, it's really the same story uh, in terms of delays, denials, and disruptions to physical activity. Um, but as, um, as many uh, physical activity programs were unavailable or shifted to virtual, um, you know, there were a lot of findings around um, youth being more sedentary or less engaged with their peers, kind of reduced peer connections. This had a lot of impacts on changes to mental health. Um, and families were really reporting the challenges in kind of the increased demands for them in terms of trying to be now the folks who are trying to provide the physical activity and, and support or sort of me mediating or moderating the online engagement um, in these groups. So, you know, those are all important considerations. And one parent said, you know, he lost that structure and that physical activity and he was sitting on screens and he had, hasn't recovered from that still um, to this day. So you know, just recognizing kind of the lasting impacts of some of those changes. So ultimately, you know, the, the policy impacts are, are sort of additional barriers to accessing services. Um, 
increase mental health challenges and sort of decreased capacity from caregivers are kind of a lot of the lasting effects that we're seeing from, from the pandemic. Um, you know, in a, in a more positive framing, uh, I think this really suggests the need for disability inclusive policy design, um, both in recovery efforts um, as, we, as we implement policies going forward, but also um, in planning with sort of public health emergencies in the future. What we were finding is many sectors had really no plans at all around inclusion um, in, in their current situations. So as they're faced with emergency situations, it's just it, inclusion became kind of an afterthought. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's really something that has to be um, putting these accessibility lenses and kind of um, uh, deeming things as essential services is a key, is a key aspect. So that's that's kind of the other key message is really building back better this design and implementing disability inclusive COVID-19 policies for response and recovery, I think is a key priority. And we're embarking on a study um, that will start early in January, where we're trying to do more of a um, um, focus groups with communities across Canada to uh, prioritize what some of those key priorities for recovery and um, future emergency planning is going to look like. And then uh, the other thing is just generally pre and, po and during the pandemic is access to services. So it, um, that has to be at the forefront and the integration of that has to be at the forefront um, and, and really trying to recognize the importance of those facilitators. So that's those are the kind of the key messages um, from, from some, what I wanted to run through today is really thinking about uh, sort of multi-sectoral approach, um, the role of data as being really important, um, this disability inclusive policy design as being really important and sort of integrative systems as being um, uh, 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 and trying to increase the facilitators as being the, the direction forward. So then moving to turning some of this research and information into policy action, policy and services and support action. Um, and this is where I think I'm hoping our panel discussion will, will kind of shift towards, but um, what we found has been quite helpful is really this co-design approach to achieving greater impact. And at the core of that has been a stakeholder advisory council. Um, many of the projects I talked about had a, a stakeholder advisory council that we met with on a regular basis, um, which included parents and caregivers, youth representatives, um, community and advocacy organizations um, with kind of diverse perspectives and experience. And one, one really tangible thing that came out of it as an example is, in, in the COVID study we did, um, we initially were planning on just interviewing caregivers. And I, I'm sort of ashamed to say that. And, and uh, it's the reality is, is the, the advisory council pushed back us on a lot and said, you need to get youth perspectives as well. And you know, I'll say that the youth perspectives we got from the study um, really was important and, and really enhanced some of the messages and, and kind of um, realigned some of the the um, priorities that we identified. So, um, you know, again, just it is, I think, really meaningful to be including um, including uh, those perspectives throughout the research process. Um, so we have and developed a number of digital stories that align with um, some of the, the COVID project and you, they can be found on our website. So if you wanted to share or use the, or, or engage again with Sarah's story or Jillian provide a story um, from a perspective of a youth with lived experience, um, would encourage you to check those out. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different approaches to engaging with government through many of the kind of formalized processes such as consultations. Um, for example, we just submitted a um, submission to the House of Commons Standing Committee um, on the Bill C-22. And, you know, it's actually an open process. So, you know, I think people can really think about engaging and submitting um, things with community groups. Um, but then, you know, of course, working with your representatives and community organizations, attending conferences and events. But one of the key things I wanted to highlight is, is really family and youth engaged research um, which is, I think, the way forward for kind of engaging evidence and information into policy and practice. To that note, um, we have the Family Engagement and Research course that the Israeli Accelerator um, is partnering with Kids Brain Health Network and Can Child, um, and it's run out of uh, McMaster University on the online system, um, and uh, that is being offered in January. And uh, the deadline to apply is December 7th. So 
um, as a really action oriented step, I just wanted to make a plug that this is available and open and it's open to researchers, staff members, trainees, families, um, community, you know, it's, it's a very inclusive um, course. So just would encourage you to check that out. Um, I'm happy to provide more details on that. It's an important step towards co-designing and family engagement and research. So on that note, um, really just wanted to bring in our panel um, that we have today. And uh, we thought it would be helpful to kind of have different perspectives on sort of um, considerations of incorporating lived experience and family perspectives and research. So with us today, we have um, Brittany Finley, who's a research associate, has been a, a long time research associate on my team, um, our disability policy research program, uh, and, Genev and has been working a lot around knowledge mobilization of late. Um, Genevieve Curry, who um, has so many roles, that was hard for me to list, <laughs> but um, you know, she's a, a, a caregiver um, of a, a wonderful son who's got a neurodevelopmental disability. Um, she's an instructor in the Family Engagement Research course. She's a, a research associate um, in, in our team, and she's also an associate professor um, at Mount Royal, and uh, is also just completing her PhD. Um, and then Marina uh, Kulo, who's an honors student graduate who just graduated last year in um, kinesiology. Um, and who did our honors project around um, physical activity participation um, and uh, currently is an occupational therapy student at uh, U of A. So um, really just wanted to put it to the, our panel here for some remarks, um, somewhat around some of these questions, but I think what, it, what might be helpful is I'll stop sharing my slides so that you can kind of easier see people's faces. Would that sound okay? And I'll kind of guide some of the discussion. But um, so the, the questions we kind of I put to them, mostly the first three, I think, are really around um, what are some of the important considerations in incorporating lived experience um, towards inclusive policy programs? What are some of the challenges and opportunities for better incorporating more meaningful engagement? And what did you learn from your experience in research? Um, and so we can start with those. Um, and uh, maybe, Brittany, I'll throw it to you first, and then we can kind of go from there. So if you just give some kind of initial remarks on that and then. Yeah, we'll for the sure. Uh, thanks, Jen, for the presentation. And thank you all for attending today. Um, yeah, as Jen said, my name is Brittany. I've been working with the team for about five years now, um, and I'm also kind of leading some knowledge mobilization initiatives moving forward. Um, with respect to the questions on the slide, um, I would say the most important consideration, and Jen did touch on this a lot in her presentation, but obviously trying to include people with lived experience um, throughout the research process is really important. Um, it really helps to make sure that when you're collecting data down the line on people with lived experience and learning about their experiences that you're doing so meaningfully and inclusively um, and equitably, and you want everyone to feel as comfortable with the research process as possible. Um, so as Jen mentioned, we do this by uh, making sure that we have an advisory council for um, our projects. We try to make sure that they are as diverse as possible and have individuals across um, different types of life experiences. So we have, you know, parents and caregivers, youth, um, people from advocacy organizations and different community groups to try to get as many perspectives as possible throughout our research design. So we're engaging with them at the beginning when we're trying to figure out, you know, what we're going to do in our project in the middle when we're in analysis and data collection. And then also at the end, when we're trying to mobilize our knowledge, we're trying to feed our um, outputs back to our council to make sure that they make sense, they're engaging, um, and then they're informative. In terms of um, what my biggest learnings would be in my experience in research um, with an advisory council, is um, just the the need to bring people with lived experience to the table, see them as equals, and they're really driving things forward. It's their opinions and experiences matter. And I think if you really listen to them and bring them in as equal partners, they can really push you to do things differently and um, really get data that's much more, there's a greater depth of experience that you receive. It's much more impactful in terms of how you can um, impact policy with the results. Um, I'll expand a little bit on um, kind of Jen's example with uh, incorporating youth into our previous study, just because I think that's such a great tangible example of how um, our advisory council really pushed us to do better. 
uh, we, when we were trying to figure out how to engage with youth, you know, they really gave us this perspective of trying to um, have a different way to engage with them beyond just a phone interview or a Zoom interview. Um, so we created an online survey to help get their perspectives. And it was a great, like we actually had a lot of individuals, um, youth that used the survey option instead of the phone or the Zoom option because it was more inclusive to them. It made them feel more comfortable. And we still got a lot of great information and data from them. Um, so yeah, I would say it's just, it's been very, um, it's been a very good experience engaging people with lived experience throughout the process. And it's definitely a way to make sure that your research and um, ultimately for us, our, uh, our policy impact is as um, deep as possible. So I'll leave it at that and uh, pass it on to the next panel member. That's great. Thanks, Brittany. Um, Genevieve, did you want to go next? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and Brittany. Um, so I've worn uh, wear right now two hats. So I certainly started out as a researcher, but then I had a child with a rare neurodevelopmental disability, as Jen said. And so then I became really interested in um, the lack of knowledge out there about the family experience and the child experience and the parent experience as a caregiver. Um, and so I really then started seeking out opportunities about how could I have my voice, my son's voice, um, as part of research and involved way back at the beginning when we actually are determining research questions. So typically, um, and many of you may have been um, participants in a research study, um, and certainly I have and my son has, but I really felt there was a need to go earlier so that the research questions are meaningful for the child, the individual, the family. Um, and so I took that family engagement and research course at McMaster. Um, I found it quite coincidentally when I was presenting at a conference about my experience of having a child with a rare disease. And it's just been really eye-opening to be involved with other parents and researchers and, re and looking at that co-design that Jennifer talked about and starting again at the beginning and the early phases of having family members or individuals as partners in the research process instead of always as the participants. And because when you can start earlier, then you can have input into what are we re researching and why, and why is this meaningful and what would be the impact of this research um, and this question that we're asking. Um, and so I would certainly encourage you to consider the, the FER course. We're, we're going to have um, a University of Calgary cohort coming up in January, as Jennifer mentioned. Um, and I've been facilitating the course now, I think it's my third time doing that as a facilitator, not as a, um, as a participant. And there is so much need for family members and um, individuals to get involved with lived experience because we're the, we're the ones with who have um, expertise with experience, right? And so clinicians, researchers are trying to partner with family members much more often. And so it's a really good opportunity um, to talk together, to communicate, to collaborate on, on meaningful research. And then that data has input already from family members working with uh, researchers and clinicians. So again, to put a plug in for that. Um, so then I've been very fortunate to work with the team, with Jennifer and my colleagues here. Um, and so I've tried to provide the family research partner perspective as well as the researcher perspective. And what I've learned along the way is, again, it's so important to have that, the voice of the individual, the voice of the caregiver involved in research and providing um, their experience and you know what's working, what's not working. Um, and certainly with COVID-19, that was a real eye-opener about how policies and things have been um, made that do not consider the, the needs of the individual with disabilities or the family members. And so again, I've been very privileged to hear those stories from other family members and um, to try and bring that forward within our research that we're doing. So again, um, Really happy to be here. Just would encourage you to get as involved as you can in whatever way you can. And um, we really need to hear more from individuals with experience and families with lived experience. So I'll pass, I'll pass it on to Marina now. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Genevieve. And then Marina, if 
you could speak a little bit about um, some of those questions, but also if you want to share any learnings from um, your study on kind of specifically around engagement in physical activity during the pandemic, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everyone, um, for sharing. And thanks, Jen, for your presentation. Um, in terms of what I learned about um, through doing that project, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was how important physical activity is in so many people's lives. And I think it's easily overlooked. And um, maybe I'm biased because my whole kinesiology under, undergrad degree was about that. But it was interesting hearing. Um, yeah, that lived experience on how exactly the tangible ways in which physical activity is impacting um, all of these participants' lives. And it's not just the children, it's also the parents. Um, so we just, I think a huge priority would be to find ways to keep the kids active um, in whatever way that is um, for them. Sometimes it would be through schools primarily, sometimes it would be through home activities with the family. Sometimes it's organized physical activity. Um, so it was interesting hearing about um, the effects COVID, had, COVID has had on that um, with everything going online and how, um, like Jen mentioned in her presentation, it kind of halted that access for a lot of people. Um, so a lot of the focus um, the participants took actually in the meeting, in our meetings was how the virtual programming was largely ineffective. Um, and this, this kind of took away from what they were able to do from before the pandemic. So um, whatever benefits they were able to get before through these programs um, were kind of limited um, through the online program. And I think something I was thinking about when, when looking at the questions was that accessibility doesn't look the same for everyone. So during the pandemic, um, I think that's why a lot of programs did switch online was because it was the only way to keep things relatively accessible for everyone with all the um, policy changes coming in and with the COVID um, safety measures. But um, I would say that it wasn't as effective in maintaining engagement for certain populations, like for children with, that are neurodiverse. Um, so that's also an important consideration. And Jen mentioned it a bit also in her presentation, but I think just the consideration of physical activity as an essential service would go such a long way. Um, there was many other things that were considered essential services, um, but certain things that like probably were one of the biggest highlights in some people's day-to-day -day, um, was not considered an essential service. So I think going back to that and finding ways to keep it accessible um, whether or not we're in a, like an emergency situation um, would be would be very beneficial. Thanks, Marina. That's fantastic. Those are such important perspectives. Um, and thanks to everybody from the panel. Is there any questions um, in the group? We've kind of gone through a whole bunch of information, questions on the presentation or for the panelists that come up. If you just want to raise your hand or just open your mic, jump in, feel free. Give everyone a minute here to think about things. Um, I also posted the link to the Family Engagement and Research course in the chat, um, like the registration link in case you're wanting to share that with anyone in your communities. Hi. Um, yeah, hi, go ahead. Hi, this is Homo. I'm a postdoc at the Faculty of Kinesiology. I'm working with Dr. Cates. I wanted to jump in and say that about my experience attending this family engagement in research course. I just finished that. It was awesome. a fantastic experience. I learned a lot about how we can engage families in every part of research from like thinking about the question to disseminating the result. I learned a lot and the, uh, through that group project that we did, uh, it was a nice experience also. Uh, we, we drafted up a, an infographic of um, uh, human rights of people with dis disabilities when they are going to be patient partners or participants in research. Uh, and due to my experience of, uh, I, I had a nice experience, experience of um, engaging autistic adults and um, 
a family member of each of them uh, in some workshops for a co-design. Uh, we aim to uh, discover their reflections and considerations about applications in the field of physical activity. And it was a neat experience of knowing about their uh, prefer preferences and favorites. Uh, and it, I found it challenging. I learned a lot during the process of how to dealing with the, this kind of research and how to be in contact with the uh, participants as uh, like end users who are attending the every part, this part of research specifically. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your interesting presentation. I just wanted to share my experiences. Oh, thanks for sharing that. That's that's fantastic. It's great to hear about that. That's wonderful. I'm glad that the course was was that meaningful. Yeah. Are there any other comments or questions? We've got a, a couple of minutes left here. Anything for the panel? Not hearing anything. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, I guess I, maybe I just as a, a way to sort of wrap up, I would sort of ask if anyone has um, anything to say about sort of directions forward for um, folks who may be delivering adapted programs or kind of thinking about um, moving forward. What, is there any sort of advice you'd give around sort of approaches for um, trying to develop more adaptive programming um, in physical activity or in sort of access to supports and services more broadly? Like I guess trying to, we've talked a lot about engaging in research, but in sort of program design, would you say that these principles kind of that we've been talking about are similar? I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Yeah, Genevieve. I would just say from my experience, um, involve families early in the design of what would work for their children. And certainly if you have children that could also talk about what they need. Um, my son, um, he's neurodiverse, so I've had him in a number of adapted programs, but he has a lot of behavioral issues. And so it doesn't work very well often in the programming, but I'm trying to get him into physical activity and interaction. So I think it's really good to, again, involve family members who could tell you what's worked and what's not worked and try and partner with them and find a way of, of making something work for those particular children or what the needs are for the families. Thank you. Thanks, that's helpful. That's a great perspective. Uh, sorry, Jen, I just wanted to say, I see that there's a question in the chat. Um, so I thought I would just read it out and then address it sure. um, as well. So awesome. it's from Hannah. Um, I'm curious about different considerations in policy for youth, adults, and seniors um, with disability. So I think that's a really good question and something that um, it came up, obviously, as we did our COVID study and we talked to youth and adults, their perspectives um, were very, while, while they did overlap, they were very different. And I think that just kind of underscores the importance of trying to engage with as many diverse voices as possible. Um, so something that came up a lot um, with, for example, our um, youth cohort that didn't necessarily come up with our parent cohort was um, implications on um, like the gender aspect. So we had a lot of participants that were um, gender diverse, identified as non-binary or transgender. And there was very specific implications on how policy needs to be designed to be inclusive of their needs with respect to their um, different gender identities, which didn't necessarily come up with the parent cohort. Um, there was a few different examples um, of differences between. So basically, I just there are different considerations and there are overlapping considerations, and it's important to talk to as many different people as possible to um, understand that moving forward. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone else on the panel that wanted to talk about that, but thank you um, for your question, Hannah. That's awesome. Thanks. That's a I think a great way to to wrap up, and I think thinking about the 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 messaging around sort of addressing those diverse, getting those diverse perspectives from families and youth, and then like thinking about how to actually address them in the design of services, programs, policies, kind of anything in that space. So I think we'll, we'll leave it there. We've got it just a few minutes for you to kind of probably get off to your next meeting or whatever happens next in your day. But 
Um, just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, Leticia and the Calgary Adaptive Hub for ha hosting us here in this forum. It's really great opportunity and a big thank you to Genevieve, Brittany and Marina for taking your lunch hour and sharing your perspectives, really appreciated. And Jen, Genevieve, Marina, Brittany, I myself and the Calgary Adaptive Hub would like to say thank you. thank you to each of you for taking the time today to present and share your perspectives with us. Wonderful. Thanks. Have a great day.